<laughs> Shalom. So sorry we're late. This is Dr. Tova Goldfine at TMS Roundtable Global. We had a little bit of technical stuff, and Rose and I are completely wearing many hats so well. <laughs> anyway, I'm happy to be here. Rose, nice to see you in Melbourne. Good morning, Tova. Introduce From our Melbourne. wonderful guest yeah. tonight. Yeah. Now, we have a wonderful young lady called Jessica here <laughs> who is a dancer and a aerialist, as well as being the executive director of PPD. She's got a, lo a lovely, amazing story of finding Sano and healing, but I'll leave that up to her. But I also want to get her to tell us a little bit more about the work that they do in PPD, yeah. because that's her, her main goal now. She's on the other side of, of her um, pain, and she understands when her pain comes that it's got an emotional background. And hopefully she'll speak about that a little as well, because I think our audience needs to understand every time we have a pain, it's got emotional background. And, you know, even if you think about it, even post-surgically in the hospital, some patients get very little pain management, others get But the medical profession don't realise that it's an emotional problem, not a physical problem, that there is pain from the injury but it isn't it isn't as how would i put it it's not as profound as the emotional pain behind the injury so jessica welcome very very strong and sincere welcome to you yeah <laughs> thank you thank you for having me a little bit. it's a pleasure tell us a sure, little well. bit about yourself and your background first mm -hmm. and then Go on to the technical stuff, please. Sure. I'll try to be brief because I can talk for days. As a dancer since They're age three, <laughs> they never let me talk. And so as soon as I stop dancing, I swear I never stop. Um, Mom, but yeah. <laughs> I'll be brief. I'll read it. Coming up. So uh, I was a dancer since age three, uh, performed nationally and internationally in musical theater, contemporary ballet and briefly as an aerialist, uh, think Cirque du Soleil, 50 feet in the air, bending in half backwards. And um, at the height of my dance career, that's when I first experienced mind-body symptoms. Of course, I didn't know that they were mind-body at the time, but they nearly ended my dance career and my life. Uh, I'll get back into that, but a bit about the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association. Now I'm the executive director for this nonprofit our mission is to end the chronic pain epidemic and opioid crisis by advancing the awareness, diagnosis, and treatment of stress-induced medical conditions, which goes by many names, but it affects millions worldwide. So our work was worldwide, and it's great that you know to be on the TMS Roundtable Global because this really is a worldwide problem, and there's not enough people addressing it, but for those who are, big portion of what the PPD Association does is uh, get people together as a community to work on different clinical research, awareness projects, documentaries, and uh, continuing education as well as resources for patients uh, wherever they are and teaming up together to do that. Yeah, and what's wonderful, I wanna say that we're, you know, we're not here to bash medical doctors, we we t all the medical doctors, they're all medical doctors and internists that work at, that are on the board at PBD, uh, PBD Association. A lot and, of them are, yeah. And the, it's, it's with all humility, you know, Dr. Strubiner said, he said, I think in, in the seminar I took with him, he was taught to either look at a, you know, a tumor, God forbid, or something structural, or he was taught to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, the doctors mm -hmm. understand their limitations. So we're here to integrate and maybe work together with doctors, but surely to say you won't get this from your doctor doesn't mean he's not doing his job. You, right. You won't get this information. So go ahead, continue. Well, quick note on the I don't know. Sometimes the most informed thing that someone can say is I don't know. It's never good to presume uh, a cause. And Point. science is all about separating causation from correlation uh so yeah when your doctor doesn't know it's just because they don't know um 
what's so important, what we tell everyone, what I've been telling everyone since I recovered in 2015 was, is to always rule out serious and worsening medical conditions with your doctor. Even if your doctor is not aware of mind body conditions, rule out the serious conditions. And then that way you can at least move forward with a biopsychosocial, emotionally focused treatment approach. And as long as you do that, that's all they need to know. They, they're good at that. Roll that out and then you have options. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. But tell us more about you. How, you were on a cruise, on a cruise mm -hmm. ship. So what was, what was actually happening? Was there um, conflict on the ship or something for you? Yeah, yeah, there was, yeah. I was anxious going into that contract. It wasn't my first uh, nine month contract. As a performer, um, a lot of my roles were traveling where you, you leave home, you leave all the people you know behind, career comes first. And for that contract, it was supposed to start overseas before it came back to the US, uh, nine months away. So I, I had a lot of anxiety prior to starting the contract, which, you know, in hindsight, I reflect that that leads to why the conditions were so bad at the time. I was purely physically focused. Um, I had health conditions with my gastrointestinal system that didn't make sense to me. My dad was diagnosed with colon cancer when I was in high school and passed away uh, just before I finished college from colon cancer. And right then in 2008, when he passed away, I began having these intense pain, blockages and colorectal bleeding that lasted the entire time after his death up until I finally made the connection. So it was six years at this point of colorectal bleeding, um, pain and doctors couldn't figure it out. I'd already had uh, multiple colonoscopies and an endoscopy and full other screenings. And one of my doctors before sending me off on the ship, she said, um, uh, you should be fine to go nine months in a contract. Um, quick question though, can they do blood transfusions on the cruise ship? I said, uh, no, they're, they're really only able to deal with kind of acute triage. She yeah. said, okay, so as long as you don't bleed out and die, you'll be fine. And I'm like, great. <laughs> so I leave my friends behind go to Florida to start rehearsals, loved the shows, loved the cast. The cast did not love me. I was very much bullied. Um, that then adds to the anxiety. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. It's not my first time being bullied, but it was my first time as an adult, like post high school. And um, so that, that hurt. I felt like I'm leaving everything behind. I really care about being here. I'm really happy to be with everyone. They were a talented team and, and then that's going on. So then by the time I board the ship, I'm like, had these intense back pains, seizing spasms in my back, but I'm going through the show, I'm going through with aerial training. And on uh, opening night, I, you know, do the kick right up to my face, which I had done for years. It's not like that was new, but suddenly it's like my back seized up so much so that I was just like, oh my God. And I make it through the show, but it was after the show that everything had kind of caught up to me by this point, the fear that I was going to have colon cancer like my dad and need chemo right. or die. Yeah. The fear that for, despite my best intentions to try to be a kind person that people can sometimes be hurtful back and that I felt like I was in a toxic work environment. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I, I also, nine months. for nine months, right. But this was the beginning of the contract. And, That's and while it's, it's complicated to explain, so I'll try to be brief. I ended up getting um, some someone who I sought to uh, get acupuncture from, actually, who was recommended by the cast and the uh, entertainment company because um, my back is hurting. And I think, you know, acupuncture worked before. Let's try it again. This person wasn't a really great person, and they ended up sexually assaulting me. Mm -hmm. I report it to the director to say, hey, you're recommending this person that's not um, good. Uh, and is this, still they, on the boat? is this still on the boat? I'm looking at no, a this is back in Florida before joining the ship. Okay. Um, okay. And their reaction was, um, that's on you. Uh, it's your fault for being injured anyway. Even though we recommended this person, it's your fault for not appreciating the treatment. Everyone oh. else likes him. You, you know, you, he's eccentric. <laughs> Deal with it. And um, if you want to oh, stay behind and report this, then you can, but you'll lose your job. So either join the ship. Or, so, or report it and lose your job. So oh, I, I, all this yeah. going into the contract. So in hindsight, yeah, I was um, emotionally suffering so much so that I physically was. 
because I was putting on a good face. No, I literally was told I'm not allowed to like say anything. I just, it's like, you know, shut up and perform. So you're really and alone. You're really alone. Yeah, I'm pretty you isolated. You went through nine months of, of shows? Well, it was supposed to be, but by that point, I am, um, after the opening night of shows, um, I went back to my cabin. The, the pain that had started during that show using my back wouldn't stop, which is, in hindsight, that's atypical. Um, if you're injured, it feels better when you stop the physical movement. Sure. When you have a mind-body condition, it can grow and grow because the emotional hurt is still there. Mm -hmm. So I go back to my cabin and I end up, um, everything's coming out of me bloody GI issues. <laughs> My, my back pain is through the roof to the point where I feel it head to toe. I'm trying not to scream because I don't want to have anyone realize that I'm so injured that I can't perform because that would be devastating to have to leave the ship. And so, but it happened anyway, I couldn't, I couldn't physically function. So sure enough, they saw that I had herniated discs and that was my first time with a doctor being like, see right here, that's what's causing your pain. So they said I needed three weeks of physical therapy they can't do it on the ship in Barcelona, so they send me back to America. And uh, three weeks of physical therapy turned into two years, 20 healthcare professionals in nearly every specialty, leading to them saying, you'll just have to deal with being in pain forever, you'll never dance again. And uh, and it, I was Whoa. at the end of my rope, literally, before a friend said, hey, have you, you know, it seems like you're going through a lot of pain. Uh, I went through that too. I read this book by Dr. John Sarno called Healing Back Pain. Maybe it'll help you, it helped me, just putting it out there. And I, at this point, literally planning how to end my life was like, sure, I got time. Uh, read the book and while reading the book, had an epiphany, these aha moments that I recovered fully within a week from 20 plus wow. chronic symptoms. And then oh that God. recovery led to me forever just completely changing my approach when I felt uh, what is essentially danger signals to to emotional trauma? Wow! Yeah. Wow. And then I can clarify what that epiphany was because a lot of people, when I started sharing my recovery story um, after I recovered, this is now in 2015. I I put up my recovery story and initially people didn't. Not all people get why someone has what's called the book cure. Like, mm -hmm. how do you read a book and get better? I didn't get better. I read mm -hmm. the book. What chapter was it? What word was it? Yeah. So. The, the thing that happened to me was at that time I was reading the book, laying down in bed and my physical symptoms, again, there was a big mix from back pain, hip pain, GI bleeding, GI obstruction between other lot, lot of GI symptoms, numbness, tingling, vertigo, dizziness, confusion, uh, chest pain, a, a mix of full body symptoms would be on and off at different points within those two years. But laying down in that moment, I was mostly physically fine. I didn't feel too much discomfort. I start reading the book. I start reading about how um, anger and rage, when you suppress that, can lead to your body manifesting these symptoms physically. Because it, it just because you don't outwardly express it doesn't mean those difficult emotions, not bad emotions, difficult emotions aren't felt. And I'm reading about how uh, steroid injections um, for your low back doesn't have really good outcomes. And I think I've already had two, one of which without anesthesia. And yeah, that wasn't fun. I'm, I'm reading about how low back surgeries aren't effective for low back pain, particularly if you have more cases of childhood trauma versus not having childhood trauma. And I think I was about to have low back surgery for my herniated disc there. I was also supposed to have uh, hip surgery and all these other treatments that Dr. Sarno is going over, this doesn't really help when you have chronic all pain. These symptoms, I just want to make clear, all these symptoms, you had all, you had the physical changes in your body before the pain. It wasn't like you caused an injury. You had these well, things before. These were not new disc herniations. Actually, yeah, it's a bit of both. So it's some, I actually did have some injuries. There was an injury in aerial training where the harness was put on too tight. It caused my- okay, um, But I meant this, but I meant when it erupted, it was not because something physical happened. It was all this emotional pressure well, the discs that, brought actually, out, that brought out the the, the, air, the parts of the body. That's what I'm trying to make a point. It wasn't like you- Well, 
Yeah, the to be clear, there there were injuries that happened at the exact moment that the um, disc herniations were protrusions at first and actually did get worse for the two years, right. which was confusing to me because right. I could only associate that. Okay, the simpler way to put it is I did have multiple injuries throughout this time. However, right. as I now know, all injuries heal. Yes, acute pain is way too is long for pain. anybody to have chronic pain, right? Chronic Rose? pain was yeah. for, you know, due to the brain and autonomic nervous right. system. So I did have injuries. I also did have certain other um, uh, organ disease processes uh, with my uh, gastrointestinal tract that were kind of triggered as an escalation, uh, like a domino effect. I've talked about it with uh, Dr. Dave Clark, who he, it's a bit of a mystery as to why um, colorectal bleeding is not a mind-body condition. However, one thing can trigger another, can trigger spasms, can trigger tearing, can trigger down the yeah. road. Yeah. Um, yeah. The when you to reverse that. Every symptom has a mind-body effect on its healing. Sure. And I know that they yeah. with me on that. There's kind of like a loop effect. Yeah, like you mm -hmm. can have an injury or an illness that then leads to more mind-body right. symptoms. So mm -hmm. for me, it was a bit of a complex, a bit of both. But sure. um, two years after the fact, my injury wasn't what was causing my symptoms, even though I did have them in rehearsals. It was um, learned neural pathways at that point. My, my brain was continuing to send a danger signal, despite the fact that the physical tissue damage threat was no longer there. Mm -hmm. It was doing that because I was still experiencing an emotional, psychological threat of loneliness and of grief and rage and of anger. Yeah, that's that's like, yeah. That is why you're the executive director of the PPD, because you just said it exactly like it is. So how did you get involved with PPD is what I'm dying to hear. Right, well, I'll I'll finish the last thought real quick because it ties into oh, that. Just because, um, you know my story, but some people listening might not. So again, I'm reading the book and while I'm reading the book and it's saying that these treatments aren't as effective, that emotions can cause pain, all of a sudden going from a like level one to discomfort, everything flares up. Practically all of my 20 plus symptoms at that time flare up. And I f it dawned on me only in that moment that all of the reasons, the, the reasons that I was told would cause each individual symptom could not be the reason for why everything flared up at once. I didn't move, it wasn't physical. I didn't take medication, it wasn't a reaction. The only reason why 10 seconds ago I was fine and now I'm flared up with everything from vertigo to chronic pain was because of an emotional change. The emotional change was anger. I was angry and upset that I was being given these treatments that weren't effective and that they were risky. And then as soon as that happened and everything flared up, for the first time I could confront those physical symptoms without fear, realizing that just because I'm experiencing discomfort doesn't mean that I'm broken. Hurt doesn't equal harm. The first time I made the connection that hurt does not always equal harm, that you can have pain as a danger signal, it started to dissipate. And then as soon as it dissipated, I realized it was possible that it could dissipate. And then it just, I didn't even have a single flare up for eight months before like a hint of back pain, address it the same way, think psychological, not physical, whoosh, it's so gone. The key for you was for to years accept, approach. like almost like what Sarno says, like you accepted 100% that this is a psychological reaction. And so the pain stopped needing to come to protect you or the alarm stopped needing to come on. Right. And the only way that I could accept that it was, uh, a mind body condition that it was psychological stress induced was only because I did truly rule everything out physically. It's not like I didn't properly get checked for my back, my intestines, my heart. I even wore a heart monitor for a month when I was having chest pain and every symptom that made me think I was having heart attacks. Wow. I ruled it out. So I did all that work. And all the doctors at that point, it got to the point where they said, well, you can get surgery. But I mean, you know, it might not help you. You do have severe spinal stenosis, so that might help with this nerve impingement. But uh, beyond that, you know, you'll just have to deal with being in pain forever. So at that point, you know, I had done all the treatment that I could have done, except for the surgeries. Luckily, I avoided the multiple surgeries that I was supposed to get. Wow. Because I recovered. Jessica, when, when that friend gave you the book or suggested the book, mm -hmm. how cynical were you? Mm -hmm. 
not cynical. Again, I was suicidal. So my, um, like, yeah, I'm being really blunt about it. I've shared it a lot. My uh, mom was heartbroken at the fact that I was planning suicide. I was, I couldn't work. I couldn't physically stand, sit, or like exist without discomfort. So it was very hard to um, have any work that wasn't gig based, like, you know, do this a little bit here, see if I can handle it. So I was going broke and I didn't want to um, financially bankrupt her. So that was one of the main reasons on top of bullying and everything that was still continuing that I thought I, I have to uh, end my life because I just can't ruin my mom's. Of course, she made it very clear that, no, that would make it worse. Uh, but anyway, I was suffering, and you don't think that clearly when you're suffering. So because of all that, no, I wasn't cynical. I, I was willing to try anything. That. This is a thought that so many people have that Rose and I speak to, and it's just, just devastating. I mean, like, I just I can imagine, like, when people have chronic pain, what it feels like when people just keep saying, no, 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 you know. Yeah, or you'll be fine. Even that is It'll kind better. of apathetic. It's a bit short. Like, yeah, you'll That's be fine. Missile, It'll be fine. It? It'll work out. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. okay, yeah. what if it doesn't? Yeah. So I have a lot of empathy when, yeah. when people are struggling and I tell them, first, do this. Like, no matter what you're feeling, try this first. Fully try this. See how you feel when you're not physically suffering. It's a lot easier to begin the emotional work to then lead to not emotionally Please, suffering anymore. And then, yeah, a lot of things. There's someone listening, I think, that's... Um, that feels like you know when i say what do you have to lose he's like i it could get worse and i'm like like it, like this is the answer i mean this is we're crushing doubt right here we are giving the answer this this is the answer especially when everything else has not worked this will work and it's 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 i can't guarantee everyone because it takes time but you know you need someone to believe and you believe look you believed you you shifted quickly. You didn't have, and yet you had reason to doubt. Well, yeah, my whole training was that everything, pain is only due to a physical tissue issue. Like you're injured, you feel yeah. pain. You don't feel pain when you're not yeah. injured. Turns out that's not true. Turns out that yeah. herniated discs are linked to age, not pain. That 37% of 20 year olds have disc degeneration and that group was asymptomatic. They did not even have pain, but they have disc degeneration. Also, disc disc degeneration can happen in young people because they're for because it's TMS because the body, you know, is constantly stressing out, and the body's you know the the brain's pulling blood and oxygen from the disc. It's it's not always because of age because young people have it. That, I think that's what you're saying. It's for other well, what reasons. I'm saying is not there's shock absorbing happen. points. It's it's normal to have disc loss. There's the reasons why we get shorter when we age. Not, I have not two me. levels of herniated discs in my neck and two in my back and completely torn cartilage in my hips, torn cartilage in my knees, and yeah, stress fractures that yelled at my feet. You're extreme sports. You're doing extreme yeah. sports. Yeah, so it accelerates it. But um but that in and of itself doesn't cause pain. There's a lot of things that kind of add aha moments to my recovery and, and why it was easier for me to um, fully relax, to trust, reflect trust. that I'm no longer, tr trust that I'm not broken, is that I, I rule out serious conditions. And then when the when your symptoms improve by using a biopsychosocial, emotionally focused approach, mm -hmm. that's the clearest indicator you can have that you you don't um, heal strong physical damage, like you don't from just uh, thinking differently. Um, what changes is your brain and your brain is a, the most vital organ in your body. It controls all your systems. You can feel pain in a leg that is no longer there, phantom limb syndrome, but you can't feel pain anywhere without your brain. Mm -hmm. So your brain is a lot more powerful than people realize too often the connotation is it's all in your head, but your brain is in your head. And, and trust me, it's it's a fascinating organ that's built mm -hmm. to respond appropriately to, to perceived danger. It might not seem like a very useful response. When I first learned about it, I remember thinking about fainting goats. It's this phenomenon in which there's a particular breed of goats, especially uh, susceptible to when they sense danger, <laughs> they tighten up and they kind of like fall over, which makes them a lot more susceptible to prey. But 
I think of it like that, even though it's not quite the same process. Mm -hmm. Sometimes something that's evolutionarily developed isn't, it doesn't seem helpful in the moment, at least for humans though, it, mind body symptoms are actually a lot more helpful than we realize. They're really awful and when you're in them, but the benefit is that it can sometimes that's tell funny. you without you realizing it's, your body doesn't speak English, it speaks symptoms yes, and it's, it's telling you it's something's like a, not right yeah. here. Like, you know, when you feel like something's a little off before going down a dark alley, that's mind body. When yeah. you get excited and, and blush or, you know, that's mind body. It's, it's like, you know, it's your gut instinct. All these words that we have in our vernacular are all describing the mind body connection. Like, oh, I, you know, he was such a headache or this person's a pain in the ass. Like it's, it's built into the vernacular, yeah. yet some people are struggle to realize that you can have physical, real physical symptoms from how your brain reacts to perceived yeah. danger. So true. Jessica, would you also tell us a little bit about all these doctors that you went to and mm -hmm. all these, um, you know, like getting expert opinions? How, how did you feel? I think the, the audience, most of the audience have been to innumerable doctors physiotherapists, what are they called in America? Ph uh, Physical therapists, yeah, yeah, same thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, could you just talk about that hopeless feeling, that getting nowhere, and, and would you have been angry with those doctors or angry with yourself for not having an answer? Good question. Well, it like in hindsight or in the moment? Cause the, so. Uh, um, in, well, I don't mind. I, I, just either my one. question is because most of our audience will have had that frustration. And the other thing that you brought up before was about the financial cost of this. Because yeah. like in some countries, well, we have public health, so we don't have the same problem. But like for you people, you have to pay. There's no tax or however. It's not, um, you don't have the public, some level of public health as we do. Not yeah, that our public right. health is that good. But, but it's that's a different, the most yeah. terrible. Yeah, yeah. So what was, I think my upbringing is being female, being a dancer, being both. I uh, was always not only a perfectionist, but a people pleaser. I was, kind of trained uh, from a young age to believe that uh, my needs are secondary, that um, I don't matter as much, um, I'm a dime a dozen. So that kind of carried over into how, into how I um, interacted with these health professionals. I figured that the less answers that they were able to give me, the more I went back to future appointments or the next time I saw a new health professional, I would try to be as put together smile on my face yeah, if I could bear it, yeah. calm. Yeah. And I would, I, I knew like, okay, I get it. I have five minutes with you. Here's my, you know, the situation started here. It felt like this, 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 and, and just very pleasantly be like, you got anything for me? Any, anything that can help? And when they would say, um, yeah, you should be fine. You'll just, you know, you'll never dance again. You'll have to deal with being in pain forever. I would do my best response to be like, oh, okay. Well, see, the thing is the pain isn't my worst symptom. Uh, my legs sometimes clap and I try to cross the street. I feel like that's dangerous. Can, any thoughts on that? They're like, oh, that's not my specialty. You have to see a neurologist. Oh, no, the hip pain isn't my specialty. You have to see a hip surgeon. And I'll like, Ur! and I would just try to communicate. Uh, one pain specialist who gave me both my spinal epidurals um, in a follow up appointment, I was beginning to express. Um, he does the typical check because I was on workers' compensation, they have to ask particular questions on the form. Mm -hmm. He asked, uh, Are you currently working? I said, um, no, uh, I still can't physically um, work. Uh, in fact, actually, it's really taking a toll. I, I feel like it's hard. I, I can't even really maintain friendships and I'm, I'm feeling really lonely. And he said, great, see you in a month. And like ran out the room. And I thought, it's like he knew I was about to say that I was whatever would count as suicidal that a doctor would have to report. And I swear he didn't want to deal with the paperwork and he was wow. out of there. And I thought, okay. So it became very clear to me that I ne needed to Never tell a doctor you're depressed was what I learned. Um, to those listening, don't do the opposite. Um, however, I was 
doing the best to adapt to what they were asking and, and me trying to give that I kept shutting my emotions off more and more, looking completely composed and just saying, how do I get better? And when they didn't have answers, um, I just, yeah, I felt lost. Um, in hindsight, I will say, healthcare professionals only go into the field, only stay in the field because they want to help people. The system isn't really built well, especially in America, to, it's a um, pay per service model versus a treat the condition model. We're working as the PPDA to change that. So sometimes you have these really wonderful healthcare professionals that just want to help people and they can only go based on what they know. And if their training and evidence shows certain things, that's where that's as far as they can go. They don't presume, they don't like to presume things. And so sometimes they say, this is as far as I go, good luck to you. And all they need is the continuing education. And that's why we're educating practitioners around the world. So yeah. they have good intentions. Trust me, they do not like dealing with chronic pain patients. We are the worst thing in their day. Um, they flat out tell us that, like they are heartbroken, they're frustrated, they want to help us, but they, wow. not everyone, you know, they, they want to help, they definitely do. Wow. And wow. a lot of times they're scared as to how a patient will react when they bring up the idea that stress and mm. past trauma uh, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences can cause symptoms. They don't really know how to have that dialogue and the PPDA is putting that in our education as to how to have that dialogue with patients. I'll give an example of, um, I had to see a urogynecologist uh, uro to figure out why I was having incontinence for a year and a half as a 27 year old dancer, That's you know, an amazing core, yet I was mm -hmm. having this issue. Again, mind body, didn't know that at the time. They do a full bladder workup, it's not fun. And afterwards they say, um, okay, it looks like it's stress incontinence. It's not, it doesn't mean anything emotional. It means like a physical valve thing. It was a misdiagnosis anyway. But when they said that, I perceived it as emotional stress and I'm sitting on the floor sobbing, saying, but I'm not stressed. And they're like, yeah, no, um, of course not. Um, no, it's not about that. Uh, anyway, bye. And um, so I wasn't even aware of the stress I had, but as soon as I was saying, but why are you giving me this diagnosis as if I'm stressed when tears down my face, I'm not stressed. And they're like, yeah, no. So again, I have a lot of empathy towards these healthcare professionals. It's frustrating that they couldn't help me then, but I'm working to change it. And mm -hmm. what patients in the general public need to know is that you know, the good news is you can rely on yourself a lot more than you think. Exactly. Rely on healthcare professionals to do what they do best. They can rule out serious physical damage and an organ disease. That is what they can do. If they say, uh, you look fine, I, I don't know what's causing your pain. I don't know why you still have diarrhea or constipation. I'm not sure what this tingling sensation is. Your nerves are fine. Then take that as good news and say, great. I will go to ppdassociation.org and learn what to do. Thank you. You've done your job. Um, and then mention maybe that they check us out too so that they can learn how to better have a conversation with a future patient. But yeah, doctors, they mean well. And I saw everything from physical therapists to cardiologists and um, social workers and, and a whole mix. Um, they only want us to get better. This epidemic is huge and it requires a lot of work to end. And when you end the chronic pain epidemic, only then can you truly end the opioid crisis. They're tied hand in hand. Wow, so true. So how did you meet Dr. Clark? Well, I mean, it, it, okay. go ahead, Rose. Slicha. Go ahead, Rose. Rose, you're going to say something? I was, yeah. yeah, yeah. And just that, the, like, her urinary problem was really um, smooth muscle anxiety. It's so simple. Right. Mm -hmm. It's right. so awfully simple. It's terrible. Yeah. Well, all, all and, this you know, strident muscle anxiety, the back. Yeah. Exactly. It's so, it's so right. simple, you know, gastroenterological problems, you know, smooth muscle anxiety. It's going right. to the smooth muscle, the anxiety. And right. It's so simple and yet it's so, un, un you know, the, the awareness isn't out there at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jessica, I, I just wanted to add that bit because yeah, it's, a good comment. You know, it's yeah. not like they don't know, they just don't make the connection. Yeah. 
Especially if you're so focused on, it felt like each healthcare professional focuses on like two square inches of space on your body. So they're not, they, they sometimes even refuse to get information about what the next two square inches right. of your body are doing. I've literally had a back surgeon say, I'm only focused on yeah. this. And I'm like, what about my hip? He's like, nope, that's for Dr. Yeah. Johnson. And I'm like, but it, but, and he's like, nope, this two square inches is where I do my thing. So, you know, the practitioners that we work with at the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association do a different uh, intake. They ask, um, you know, a stress questionnaire. They assess what was going on in your life at the time the symptoms began. What's going on in your life now that's keeping these symptoms going? And, that's right. and when you collect more information than just, yeah. did your back hurt? What did you do? you that's the only way you can get better and i'll clarify that it can be very confusing for a lot of people when sometimes alternative medicine or traditional approaches help maybe they help briefly a lot of times that's because of the placebo effect and that only further ties into why the brain is really involved with recovery if something works sometimes but not others it's because you felt safe in that moment and also, look, we know that certain people get TMS. Mm -hmm. because yeah, we're more prone to it. it. But that it comes and goes. I mean, you can mm -hmm. sprain an ankle and it can go away in a couple of days. You can sprain an ankle yeah. and it can you know, chronic you know, pain. So it, it depends on the personality, the person, the timing. I mean, like all the things happened with your dad and mm -hmm. growing up and everything was fine. It seemed like you could have handled it and then you get this job and you go in and you get bullied. So you don't really know when the body was like enough. I cannot, there's too much repression. I cannot, I was managing these herniations. I was managing this belly. We were doing okay. And then mm -hmm. you were, oh, here comes a big amount of repressed feelings. Like, and the body's like, I can't, I can't. I've got to, to say something louder to this person. Cause then it's like a communication. Your body's saying, please, Give me attention, mm. please listen to me. I don't know how to get your attention. So this, right. this awareness is, is just, you know, I was reading something about that. We grow up thinking pain is bad. This is what you said either in your interview or in the beginning, pain has a purpose. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that it's not bad or good. It has a purpose. Yeah, a life-saving purpose. Mm -hmm. It's... You know, yeah. people who physically are born or somehow lose the ability to feel pain die younger. You, wow. pain is really life-saving. It's not that it's comfortable, but think of it. If you put your hand on a hot stove and you don't feel that that's dangerous. Yes. You know, like, and, and similarly, if you don't feel the physical discomfort that you're in a toxic situation, an unsafe environment, enough to make you think I need to do something different, I need to leave, I need to get out of here, something has to change, then that also would be dangerous. Then you're just still there. Yeah. Um, the, what mostly these symptoms are telling you to do, um, and the only thing that really makes them go away is reducing fear and addressing a lot of things that cause that fear to be react more sensitively to you than maybe some other people when you f do things that feel safe and and help yourself feel like you're in a safer situation physically mentally with who you're with um that activates the parasympathetic system that helps your body relax these are like yeah. kind of the rest and digest moments otherwise a lot of the symptoms i was experiencing is when you're in the sympathetic state of like er, ready to fight flee or freeze and yeah. um, that when that goes on chronically, that causes a lot of problems. Do, the good news just, is it's reversible. Yeah, I want to say that you were also like for you to heal. You're not the typical because you know you learn to be um, compassionate to yourself quickly. You learn to accept quickly. You learn to like let go of the past and accept it. You weren't blaming, you know, you let go of this guy that was abused you. Like you were able to somehow pull together all the things that, that are helping people that, that are prohibiting people to heal in a more efficient way because they're having a hard time letting go. They're controlling because they're full of fear. So you, mm -hmm. something clicked with you, something clicked with you, unusual, 
you because you've had trauma you've had childhood trauma you've had adult trauma mm -hmm. what do you think that click was <clears throat> i think um it's a good question i get asked that a lot um there's some different categories one when it comes to at least pain i think the advantage to having been a dancer which is a form of an athlete is that we're not afraid of pain we are very used to pain it's normal the you know it's it's not something that concerns us what concerns dancers and athletes is is this sensation going does it do i have an injury that's going to slow me today tomorrow or forever as long as it's not going to yes. slow you today tomorrow forever eh, you have pain yeah. so once I made that connection that hurt doesn't equal harm, just because I would then have these little flare ups, I didn't fear the sensation because I knew that underlying, I wasn't broken, I was healthy. I had ruled it out that my organs are fine, my body is fine. And it's just a sensation. And it's just like, a, hey, just letting you know that maybe you should take care of yourself today. And I'm like, okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. So it was sh totally shifting my perspective on pain and other uncomfortable sensations Good. that they're just like uncomfortable emotions. At the time I was way more afraid of uncomfortable emotions, particularly grief. I really held on Good. to that for a long time after my dad died. Um, I wasn't there. He told me to stay in school and get straight A's. Uh, he was a perfectionist too. So when he died, I wasn't there. My whole family was, I wasn't. And I constantly had dreams that he was still alive, but dying. And then I woke up to be like, oh no, my dad's dying and wake up and realize, oh, nope, he's dead. So I held on to that grief for a long time. And um, I thought dealing with the grief was way worse than dealing with uh, anything else. Turns out dealing with physical disabilities that stop your career and nearly like, you know, end your life. That's way worse than dealing with point. emotions. Point. I didn't know that at the time, but I do now. Yeah. Um, even emotions about past, you know, sexual abuse. Um, turns out, you know, feelings aren't as scary when you actually face them. Um, it's hiding from them that feels worse. That's the problem. Yeah. So that's that's well, the big reason of the click. About, yeah. Yeah. Think about hiding physically from someone or something. Like the the energy that would be brought into that physical hiding yeah. is brought into hiding from grief and sadness. And yeah, it's, it's 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 as profound. It's more right. profound, actually. Yeah. Right. Well, and also Jessica, how how did you get to the PPD? Because I noticed that Susie's asked about PPD, yeah. and someone yeah. else has asked about it. It's Maybe you can, so before, you, before you tell us about that, which we want to hear about how you met Dave Clark and became his his co his co his co chef. His co -chef. Can oh, you answer Susie's question, please. Yeah. Can you underline that PBD is not just about pain, but numerous chronic health concerns? Yes, definitely. Um, as someone who's experienced a lot more than just chronic pain conditions, the numbness, tingling, chest discomfort, GI symptoms, there's a lot of um, non-pain symptoms that fall into PPD or mind-body conditions. Uh, again, those were my bigger concerns than just chronic pain. At the time when doctors said, you'll have to be in pain forever, I was more concerned that my legs sometimes collapsed and I couldn't feel them or that I was wetting myself despite and no one had any fix for it. Mm -hmm. Also, um, there's a bit of debate about how much uh, mental health conditions like anxiety, depression, OCD, uh, how eating addiction, disorders, addiction, addiction mm -hmm. um, how much these things are PBD versus just are commingling and often present with PBD patients. The main point is that they can be treated similarly with the same approach because um, depending on how severe your depression anxiety is, like generalized anxiety and depression, uh, a lot of the same treatment of reducing fear, addressing adverse childhood experiences, improving uh, an environment which you feel safer within yourself, around your surroundings, these things do help the psychological manifestations as well as the physical manifestations. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we have all that information on our website, too. Yeah, I think a lot uh, of that, also, much of that has been addressed as well. 
um, yeah. through ISTDP. So right. it, it has right. been addressed, but maybe, you know, it, again, it's in the pocket and, of course, it's not seen, yeah. Mm -hmm. But Alan Abbas has sort of got a lot of that on his website uh, yeah. about the yeah. connection between, yeah, he's a psychiatrist. We've got another psychiatrist coming on at the end of the month who uh, is going to talk about grief and loss. Mm -hmm. So um, in relation to um, depression, et cetera. So we've got, we've got a group of doctors and that that actually can verbalise that for our, for our viewers as well. So mm -hmm. just yeah, I a mean, little can, can we, for the... <laughs> yeah, it's good. I mean, but Rose, don't you think we can make a statement that, you know, anxiety, stress, um, panic attacks, people pleasing, insecurity, all this turns into if we don't if we don't address these feelings and and become authentic with ourselves and say i'm okay being shy or i'm okay being scared or i'm okay having some anxiety growing up like if i can't accept and own it it'll turn into chronic pain or chronic disease or chronic illness or chronic numbing or weakness or just un unexplained medical symptoms can we make that statement from what we've been through this year and a half talking to people what do you think, Rose and Jessica? Uh, I'm, I'm. You, you broke up on me a, a moment oh. ago. Sorry. Okay. Like well, another I can respond. Yeah. Yes. The, <laughs> there's definitely been an increase in um, mind body symptoms during the pandemic. Um, I, I do like to be honest with people that it, I do have relapses at times. They tend not to be chronic because I address them the same way. Up until certain recent major events, my symptoms, I could use the same approach and they would go away within seconds, minutes, or hours, depending on the symptom. The times in which they've been uh, longer lasting, like kind of repeating for weeks, eventually they still go away the same way, uh, are from big, big things. Like the pandemic, I experienced hair loss. It was very annoying. Wow. It was just, you know, clumps of hair. And um, I knew what was causing it. Uh, your grandfather died your grandfather passed away. well this happened before that but mm -hmm. i kind of was worried for him as soon as mm -hmm. the announcement came i was yeah worried for him and yeah he died from uh covid19 mm -hmm. um the so certain symptoms can take a little longer to relieve because it literally takes longer for your hair to grow back than for your brain to stop sending a pain signal so i handled it the same way but again it's a global pandemic i'm very empathetic i was very scared for my loved ones and I was isolated from them, living alone. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's normal to have relapses in those moments. It's, Absolutely. that's okay. Yeah. And even yeah. the executive director of the PPDA can still have relapses in a global pandemic. <laughs> Other times where I've experienced uh, certain relapses you, are human. big drama. I mean, TMS, TMS we, like, remember we all have this. It's how we respond and not react. And now we have the knowledge. Yeah. And, and the, and the skills to be compassionate. Like, hey, this is a tough time. This is a really tough time. Yeah, you have to be compassionate with yourself first uh, to realize yeah. that it's it's okay to be human and feel the full range of emotions to yeah. need time and to, um, you have to have, sometimes you need more time for self-care. Uh, I'll clarify that because I didn't say that before. The other thing, something that wasn't so much a click it was more of a process in my recovery was that at first I recovered right away. Removing fear, I got better. What sometimes took longer was if I'm still in an environment that is in some way toxic or enduring. Good point. It's going to keep triggering those symptoms so you can keep dealing with that. Well said. Which is kind of like managing yeah. or you can, if you can, I know it's not always easy, you can try to get out of that situation. Yeah, There are reasons why I quit dance. It, I got back to it, I could physically do it again. I left because I was happier and felt less like a dime a dozen doing right. something else. And I wanted to help others. So it was you right. know, combo too. There are reasons why I moved away from a certain um, situation that was bad for me. So uh, yeah, sometimes I kept, I would have relapses more often if I was in a bad situation and then as soon as I could work towards changing that, then that helped. It's not always required that someone has to totally uproot their life or change their personality. It's just that sometimes, you know, it might be best to set boundaries with people in your life. That's a big part of it, especially if they are ace perpetrators. 
if they are also triggering of the ACEs you have, you sometimes have to set boundaries and yeah. those changes will have more longer lasting effects. It makes it easier on you moving yes. forward. So I see we have another question. From Paula, you want, can you read it? Can you see it, Rose? Yeah, I'm what sorry, are your steps? Childhood. I'm just typing out you. you said you said ACE. ACEs, and I'm just want to put child adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, which you, makes you, someone more prone to having physically experienced symptoms later in life. Um, mm -hmm. One of the reasons it's not just about being a perfectionist or people pleaser. It's what happens a lot of times in your childhood that also makes you a perfectionist and a people pleaser. Right. Um, those are kind of coping mechanisms for whatever you went through and, and any way that ties in the later. Yeah. So Paula asks, what are the steps to process and acknowledge the TMS as the symptoms come? What are your steps to process and acknowledge the TMS as, as the symptoms come? For me, it's, if I feel a symptom, here's an example. I was working in Chicago pre-pandemic and I felt this overwhelming lower right quadrant abdominal pain. It took my breath away. I, I could barely gasp for air on the toilet as I'm like, everything is seizing in that area. I had a moment of panic thinking, you know, at first I'm like, okay, it's just, all right. But it kept happening and it kept happening very frequently. I start to think, am I having um, appendicitis? Mm -hmm. I, I think like, okay, I, I should probably rule this out. Um, Luckily, I got to talk to Dr. Dave Clark on the phone mm -hmm. saying, I'm out of state, health insurance doesn't mm -hmm. cover me. Should I go to the hospital now or can I wait mm -hmm. till I get back home? He said, it's by how you're describing it, it's probably PPD. So I consulted a health professional, but when I got back, it was still bothering me. So I ruled it out. I had a, um, because I have a history of uh, GI issues and a family history of mm -hmm. cancer, I ruled it out. I got a, um, a CAT scan with IV contrast I got another, my third colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. And um, and after ruling it out, they said, okay, everything's fine. Nothing should have been causing your symptoms. And I could officially be like, it's okay. Nothing's mm -hmm. wrong with me and the pain immediately goes away. Um, so that's an example of rule it out, move right. forward. And you might have some stress sometimes when, when, you're, you know, do, you know, when you're doing something that you've been doing where you might've had pain, it's like the same thing. We have to change and that part of the brain, that road, that travel. And what you are learning is this road from your head to your heart, the road from your head to your heart. You keep talking about it. So that was an example. So you can continue with Paula's questions to process and acknowledge. Right. That was right. Example. So and then I don't always see a doctor every time a symptom flares up. I do when it seems serious or worsening and, you know, Having appendicitis would be serious. So you want to roll that out. If you, you feel like you're having a heart attack, that's serious. Yeah. You want to roll that yeah. out. Um, but if you're having like a flare up that you've had before and it's already been rolled out, then you can more quickly uh, work to address, okay, what's going on in my life? How can I make myself feel safer? How can I take time for self-care, sleep, eating well, hydrating? These things are very important. Communicating with relationships when you have frustrations, even if they're simple, just communicating, open and honesty, um, taking time for yourself, doing something that is just for pure joy, that's not for anyone else. Uh, all these self-care strategies uh, can really help alleviate symptoms. And if it's not going away immediately, be patient. And if it, if you're struggling to be patient if it's lasting, particularly if, you've, if you're struggling to recover and it's been a month, seek help. See a trained mind-body professional. Uh, we have a full directory of psychophysiologic disorder trained practitioners. Um, get help, see, see someone. And you know, so that someone can walk you through like they're physically spotting you through the stages of recovery. Um, one of the things that therapists do in this approach is help you build a list of confirmatory evidence that your symptoms or single symptom is being caused uh, from your brain, from your mind, not from a physical injury or disease. Uh, that would be like um, if your back only hurts when you do chores, but not like, you know, full kayaking or whatever is fun for you, then, you know, 
that design. If it only hurts on Tuesdays, not any other day of the week, what are you doing on Tuesdays? If it like kind of hurts in your sleep, um, that's one. If it hurts only on one side, if it shifts around, if you have a whole bunch of symptoms at once, uh, Dr. David Clark and Howard Schubiner put together a 30 point questionnaire mm -hmm. for context for symptoms that's on our uh, website as well. Mm -hmm. So all of these oh, yeah. things, that that step-by-step -step checklist, I go through that in my head automatically. But for those mm -hmm. who are new to this, definitely go to uh, our website and see that um, it's right on the symptoms page. I recommend that if you're a, a patient or a general public, you uh, like a loved one of a patient, go to everything under the patients tab. If you're a practitioner, there's a tab for you. And if you are a healthcare organization listening to this and looking to actually improve the quadruple aim and treat your patients better while helping your health professionals uh, feel uh, like they can do their jobs better, then yeah, we have information for you too. Wow. So how did you meet yes. Dave Clark and how did you get, like you're a dancer, like you're doing, the, yeah. you're doing what Rose and I are doing. We're in tech, we're doing tech, technical business and we're healers and we're like, we're able to do it. So you were a dancer and all of a sudden you're, you're like working with Dave Clark. How did that happen? <laughs> to be fair, I, I referenced mostly that I was a dancer aerialist because it's the most, um, uh, it's the, best connection to explain that I went from being very physically capable to completely crippled to back to being capable again. But as a performer, if anyone listening is a performer, you know, we have a lot of jobs and I learned a lot of skills in a lot of areas. So I actually had a lot more jobs than just dancer um, in, in marketing and being a brand ambassador, fundraising, working for fortune 500 companies. So uh, but my main passion was in the performing arts. Uh, so by having experience in film as an actor, I had certain skill sets. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell the story of how I met Dr. David Clark. I, I found out about uh, mind-body conditions in early 2015. I began researching online to learn more. I found the TMS Wiki. I found certain other resources. I it took me until the fall to find out that the uh, ppdassociation.org and I contacted some of the board members there at the time, Dr. Dave Clark being one of them. And I said, here's my background. Here's my story. How can I get involved? Oh, wow. He said, um, that's so great. You want to get involved. That's amazing. So what I recommend is um, become a licensed healthcare professional the fastest approach would probably to become an LCSW, a licensed uh, clinical social worker, treat 10,000 patients like we did, and then write a book. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, or, um, and so I created a YouTube series sharing my recovery story using the skills that I had in kind of film, marketing, branding, public speaking, put all that together. It generated awareness and it caught the attention of the same board that said, I don't know, become a health professional. And they wrote back to say, oh, that's neat. I didn't even think about doing that. Um, great, can you help us with some more uh, projects? Um, oh, wow. So I, I helped with projects wow. that they were doing, helped fundraise for things. And and uh, along that collaboration for a few years, I was also taking a lot of continuing education in medical neuroscience and administration and, and uh, psychophysiologic disorders from every uh, educator mm. in the space. And, yeah, and eventually I just thought, um, it would be great to team up and uh, help them. They're a wonderful group of healthcare professionals, researchers, and patient advocates, but uh, they needed someone to help with the administrative side. Yeah. And as a dancer slash 50,000 <laughs> things, I knew that I could be that person to do the 50,000 yeah. things that it takes to kind of, yeah. you know, the in-between stuff. So yeah. Yeah. I, I'm very grateful to be with them and it's a, I'm used to learning how to learn and and, and just kind of teaching myself skills. Right. Again, this is especially right. what gig people and performers have to do. So it's a constant uh, learning curve to see. I, I knew what the problem was before joining the PPDA. I, I'd done a lot of market research to, because when I recovered, my first thought was, A, how did I not know this before? Mm -hmm. B, wow. people should know this. C, how do I need to help people know this information and have access to this information? Only when I joined the PPDA did I realize what 
some of these obstacles are that as a non-healthcare professional, I did not realize how complex the healthcare system is. Just because there's 50 years worth of research that we put in our bibliography of, you know, annotated and indexed bibliography of 215 mm -hmm. uh, papers, even that, it's still slow to change a healthcare paradigm. Uh, it turns out that's just kind of how it works. The mechanics of how health insurance works uh, slows the process, but the good news is um, one of the PPDA board members, Dr. Howard Schubiner and his colleagues are collaborating with United Health Group, the largest health insurer on the planet uh, to implement this approach and they're testing it with model pain clinics around the country. Amazing. Uh, so people are beginning to take this seriously. We've, there's a clinical uh, randomized controlled trial that's gonna be published soon that the PPDA sponsored. It's a groundbreaking chronic pain trial. So that's gonna come out. That will really help shift the paradigm. There's new books coming out. We're writing a second textbook. We're putting on a uh, conference for professionals in the fall, virtually, because, you know, virtually. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a lot of things that we're doing to, to address these obstacles. But what I realized is that you have kind of health insurers at the top, practitioners on one side and patients on another, and it's a gridlock. It's just, you have to shift all of it to get anywhere. Um, exactly. We're working with all that. And we're one of the only groups in the world and the only nonprofit that is really focused on working on all of it, not ju just treating patients, not just working with practitioners or not just consulting health insurers, but we're, we're really working to shift the whole paradigm. And it's frustrating that it's hard, but you know, we're, we're it, it makes a lot more sense now why it's taken this long for people like me and for yeah. those listening to have ever heard about this, but we're overcoming these obstacles and we really think we're at a tipping point where we're going to see a lot more change. Um, one of the great things is just because this hasn't become standardized everywhere yet, it's becoming standardized in certain places uh, like United Health Group, um, doesn't mean that you can't still use this treatment approach, rule out the serious things and then use this treatment approach. Um, patients have more, more power these days uh, than they did before. Mm -hmm. um, and so at least that's good. You don't have to feel like you have to wait for the healthcare paradigm to change. We're working on that. You just focus on you and you recover. And when you need help, there's resources. We're always creating more. So Fantastic. Yeah. Jessica, this has been a beautiful, beautiful session. I hope, I hope our viewers can take, take from you that whole notion that it's an internal thing that you have to do. You have to sort of look at the whole picture. You know, like you said about the fact that um, I've got to be able to prove to myself that this pain is happening even when I'm not in pain, when, mm. when the pain shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. My pain isn't happening when I'm out swimming or something. So why is that? Now, you've given, you've given our audience a whole picture to actually reflect in their own lives how this pain is affecting them. And you also talked about ACEs and the fact that um, if your job or your relationships are not really quite right, then that's another repressed emotion that's coming up. And it has to be addressed whichever way, whether it's managing it or removing yourself. So you've brought that out as well. What else have you brought out? Um, you've brought out the, uh, the whole sort of picture. Good summary. For TMS patients. Yeah. Yeah. What what other I've I've missed something, I think. No, I uh, like yeah. a big carry way is it's okay if you have flare ups. That's okay. Don't yeah. panic. Treat it the same yes. way. Really like just if you take anything away, it's don't panic. There are resources. You trusted and, so you yeah. trusted your body. You trusted your body. You were like, this body is not against me. This body's yeah, it's trying to help okay. you. Yeah. Okay. But, but Jessica, you've got one advantage to most of people, and that is that your occupation, your dancing background is painful. <laughs> yeah. <you> know, <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's most the one advantage. Us, yes. Most of us don't have that. So you've got that yeah. extra insight. 
that most other people don't I can understand it's have. harder for someone with a desk job yeah. to not fear if they have pain when they sit. Um, so yeah, as someone who's used to discomfort, it was easier for me to relax despite discomfort so that it can go away. Also to clarify, no one in this field says that what you do isn't to get rid of the pain or symptoms. It's to get rid of the fear right. or the underlying stress triggers behind right. them. It's right. like the matrix and the spoon. You can't <laughs> bend the spoon with your mind. That's not possible. You have to realize there is no spoon. There is no damage. There is no disease. If you ruled it out, therefore, there is no spoon. Right. And that's when it goes away. So don't be like, oh, I'm getting rid of the pain. Oh, I'm thinking it away. It's like, no, you're, you're thinking away that you're okay, you're safe, or you're going to get yourself to a safe situation. You're going to take time for yourself. And then it dissipates. It dissipates when it can dissipate. It's the, um, I really want to share this really quick. It's kind of like the, um, one of the images I have in my mind is, um, imagine that your house, uh, that you have a trash can in your house and it's on fire and there's a mirror right next to it reflecting the that you have a trash can on fire. What a lot of treatments, traditional and alternative do and what a lot of people's reaction is, is they'll, they'll see the fire in the mirror because that's where you're facing. That's your perspective at the time. And you're throwing water at the mirror Lovely. to like, oh, I gotta put out the fire. I see fire, I gotta put it out. So you're treating the wrong thing. You tossing water at this, Per, you know, the perspective that you see to, to throw water on this mirror is never gonna put out the fire. It might eventually go out if it like runs out of fuel, if something about it situationally changes, it runs out of oxygen or paper or whatever. But, uh, and then you might think, oh, see, I did it by throwing water, it got rid of it. No, but it could come back again. The only way you actually address it is by shifting your perspective, realizing what's actually causing that fire and addressing that, you know, fire. Yeah, and then just like there's different learning modalities, people learn differently. Um, there are different ways to put out a fire. You can, Good you know, point. get rid of the fuel. You can get rid of the, um, you know, the heat, or you can, you know. You know. So there's, it, that's the same way of why certain different mind body approaches might work for, to better for different people. Some people might prefer uh, working on themselves and um, physically getting back to what they're doing and pushing through it. Some people might prefer therapy and having someone guide them through it. So there's multiple ways to put out a fire. There's multiple ways to recover, but remember, know what's actually causing that fire it's your brain and it's your nervous system wow. and uh throwing water at a mirror is not going to help trust me i tried yeah. <laughs> it's yeah so well explained uh, well explained fantastic. so yeah. i put up the pbda association.org i know you're available um on the facebook also the 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 website is so informative. There's so much information that can be printed. Um, I downloaded. It's unbelievable. Um, Dave Clark's a friend for all of us, and he's been on our show, and he's popped in very many times. And we'll have you. Got, we'll have you two again together. And um, I, I, it's just been. I'm so happy that you made yourself available in the middle of the day. This is a. We have this video. We'll be on our YouTube. So I'll send it to you. And um, people can listen to it again. And I know that, um, Rose, do you want to say anything else to Jessica before we, we sign off? No, just to thank her very, very much. It's yeah. just been lovely having you. Thank you so much. Joy. And, and also, you, you brought a different perspective to, to the whole thing, that, you know, pain with your job is normal, mm -hmm. your original job. It's normal. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> because I'm a midwife, I was thinking, as you were talking about the fire, I was thinking about the first time someone goes into labour, it's like, oh, my God, it's so bad. And the fear, it's the fear of what's going on. The experience. The or, yes, right, but Rose. The, but, but the second or third time, you just know it's labour. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's really it's fear it's like, that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's fear. Yeah, well, that's the difference. Ross Trubiner said it's not the it's it's versus it's the fear, it's the experience of the pain that's causing you stress. Think There's about a mix it. of factors. Yeah, like it's it's fear for a lot of people, it's kind of triggering things for another, it's 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 a whole blend. So different things are going on and that you know tell your brain what to do. Um yeah. And at the end of the day, it's just trying to 
it's just trying to help you. It you it's like an alarm going off and you just you have to acknowledge it eventually you have to acknowledge it even if you're not like if you, if you don't have time for it right now it's still gonna go off you have to I'll get back to you later just i'll get back to you later <laughs> yeah you can't press snooze too much it'll it'll just shift and then you, suddenly you're feeling it here and you're feeling it there it's because you're pressing the snooze button so yeah and it's okay and the good news is you can recover it does take longer for some people than others that's okay but also no it doesn't have to it doesn't inherently have to there's nothing that stops you from recovering as quickly as you're ready to um so do know that it is possible to recover quickly and have ups and downs and you know there's there's different routes but keep trying and if you feel stuck seek other resources and get help and that's okay and, we're all human and and notice your impatience yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> and work on and your that. self critical <laughs> and your self judgment like yeah. Like, get on with it. Get on with it. Anyway, where did Rose go? Yeah. Maybe her computer went out. But anyway, Jessica, oh, there you go. Oh, you're back. Jessica, yeah. I'm so happy it all worked out, this technical stuff, because um, yeah. Rose and I are really becoming an expert. We're going to, you know, put up. So anyway, yeah. have a wonderful, wonderful day. Rose, have a great day. I'm going to bed. Oh, I'll see you tomorrow. Good, good night. night. God bless. Good night. Well. And good afternoon, good Jessica. Night. <laughs>